So Paul in talking to the Ephesians of the many wonderful blessings that they have. He begins the chapter by saying, Thanks be unto God who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And he is talking now about these wonderful spiritual blessings. He's called us, adopted us, forgiven our sins, And now in whom ye also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after you believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of His glory. Paul, writing to the Ephesians, talks about their being sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. In the days that Paul was writing to the church in Ephesus, it so happened that at that particular time in history, The city of Ephesus was one of the major seaports of Asia. Most of the goods coming from the east to be sold in the western empire of Rome came through the port of Ephesus. It was the merchandising center of the world. Great caravans would come from the east bringing their wares. Merchants from Rome would gather in Ephesus to purchase these articles that were brought in order that they might be sent to Rome and distributed through the Roman Empire. The great port city of Rome was Puteoli. And the merchants would purchase the goods there in Ephesus And then pack them for shipping to Puteoli. And having packed them, they would then seal them. They would put this wax seal on the merchandise. And then they would put the imprint of their signet ring. Their mark of ownership. And then the goods would be placed on the ship and sent to Rome. When they would arrive at the port of Puteoli, the servants of these merchant men would go down and as the ships were being unloaded, they would identify their master's goods because of this seal that was upon them. It was the stamp or the mark of ownership. Paul is saying to them that God has put his stamp of ownership on you. And that stamp of God's ownership is his Holy Spirit. How glorious it is to receive and to have the Holy Spirit because we have that assurance I belong to God. That's His seal on my life to prove His ownership of me. Jesus, you see, purchased you from the slave market. You were once a slave to sin. You were in the bondage of corruption. But now you belong to Him. Paul wrote to the Corinthians, What know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which you have of God, and you are not your own? Don't you realize that your body is is the temple of the Holy Spirit? You're not your own. You've been bought, he said, 
with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit which are His. We are really not our own to, to direct or to live as I please. It is not mine to order my own life, to choose the way I would go. I belong to Him. He purchased me. He put His mark of ownership on me. And now I live according to His will. For He purchased me. I belong to Him. Peter wrote, For as much as you know that you were redeemed not with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain lifestyles which you receive by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Jesus Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot. You've been redeemed. You've been purchased. Not with corruptible things like silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Jesus. God purchased you, and now He claims you as His own. You are His purchased possession. He has placed His seal of ownership on your life. Actually, we're like merchandise on the ship headed for the home port. And when we arrive, he's going to say, yes, that's mine. Got my stamp on it. There's my seal. They're mine. And Jesus will, you, will acknowledge you as his. Now, as a child of God, think of that one for a moment. As a child of God, he has promised to you a rich inheritance. Paul, in writing to the Romans chapter 8, said, For the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs. Heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that you suffer with Him, that we may be also glorified together. Peter said, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to His abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a living hope by the resurrection of Jesus from the dead, to an inheritance that's incorruptible, undefiled, that fades not away, that is reserved in heaven for you who are being kept by the power of God. Glorious inheritance. Thank God. We have this inheritance that is incorruptible. It is undefiled. It fades not away. It's reserved in heaven for you who are being kept by the power of God. The psalmist said, Oh, how great is his goodness, or thy, oh, how great is thy goodness, which thou hast laid up for them that fear thee, which thou hast wrought for them that trust in thee before the sons of men. Oh, how great is the goodness that God's laid up for you and for me. How marvelous, how great is that goodness. Paul speaks of the riches of his goodness, the riches of his glory, and the riches of his grace. The goodness, the glory, the grace, the riches of them. Now, Paul tells us here that the Holy Spirit is the earnest of that inheritance. The earnest was a down payment or a deposit. 
we have the phrase earnest money. And that is the money that you put down to show that you are earnest in your intent to purchase that merchandise. I want to prove to you the earnestness of my intention. I don't have all the money with me right now, but I'm going to give you a deposit. Earnest money. This money indicates to you that I am intending to complete the transaction. Should you advertise a car for sale and someone comes over to look at the car, they take it for a ride and they say to you, I like it, I want it. I'm going to buy it. Save it for me. I don't have the money, but I'm going to go to the bank and and see if I can't negotiate a loan. But I don't want you to sell this car to anybody. Save it for me because I really want this car. Now, if you are wise, you will say to them, well, give me a deposit. Show me that you really intend to, that you are earnest about this. Because you see, if you just say, okay, it's yours, you know, and they go off, you may never see them again. And it might be that many people will come by and they say, oh, that, that's just what I'm looking for. I want to buy it. Oh, no, no, I've already sold it. But yet that person may never return. And you may pass up a lot of buyers because you are holding it for someone who is never going to come back. Because you didn't get a deposit. Maybe while they were on the way to their bank, they went by a used car lot and saw another one that was a little better than yours and a cheaper price. And so they bought it and they thought, you know, they don't have any obligation to you except their word because they didn't give you any earnest money. So God wants you to know that He's really sincere about redeeming you. He intends to go through with this transaction. He doesn't plan to back down. And so to show his intent, he has given you the deposit of the future glory that he has promised to give to you. And that deposit is the Holy Spirit. And when a person is filled with the Spirit, the fruit of which is love and joy and peace and long-suffering. And, and when you're filled with the fruit of the Spirit and you're so blessed and so overjoyed, you think, oh, this is such a rich and glorious life filled with the Spirit. Hey, that's just the deposit. Wow. <laughs> that's just the beginning. And so God is just showing you that He is earnest and sincere in his intention of that full redemption. And so Paul speaks of it, the Holy Spirit, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession. Paul in the fourth chapter of Ephesians said, and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. So God's got His mark of ownership, the Holy Spirit upon your life. It's the seal. It's God's mark of ownership. It's the deposit, that which God has given to you as sort of a deposit or a down payment to show to you that he is earnest is in his intention of redeeming you. But now Paul tells him, don't grieve 
the Holy Spirit of God that has sealed you unto the day of redemption. One day God is going to come. He's going to claim you as His. He has agreed to redeem you. He's made the deposit and He has given to you the Holy Spirit to prove His earnest intent. Second Corinthians one twenty two. He said, "Who hath also sealed us and given the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts?" Much the same idea as Ephesians: sealed us, given us the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts. And then Paul goes on to say in Second Corinthians five five. Now he that hath wrought us for the self same thing is God, who also hath given unto us the earnest of His Spirit. Thus, the gift of the Holy Spirit gives me great comfort and great consolation. I know that God is going to complete that which He has begun of my redemption. He is going to claim me as his own. Now in the fourth chapter where Paul exhorts them not to grieve the Holy Spirit of God whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. In the context of that verse, Paul shows to us things that do grieve the Holy Spirit. Beginning with verse 25, Paul said, Wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. One of the first things on the list that Paul gives us of things that grieve the Holy Spirit is lying. Under the law, God said you're not to bear false witness. You're not to lie. God desires truth in the inward parts. And lying grieves the Holy Spirit. He said, let not the sun go down on your wrath. And Being wrathful is another characteristic that grieves the Holy Spirit. Actually, it sort of grieves us at times. I mean, when we've lost it and we lose our temper and we do some dumb thing or say some dumb thing, we're often grieved ourselves over uh, our display of wrath and anger. And we often feel very badly after such an experience. But it grieves the Holy Spirit. Then in verse 28, he said, let him that stole, steal no more. Taking something that doesn't belong to you grieves the Holy Spirit. And then he said, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. Corrupt communications. Filthy stories, stories with unclean innuendos. These things grieve the Holy Spirit. Corrupt communication. And that's where he says, and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. It comes there just as he listing these things. Because these are the things that grieve the Holy Spirit of God. And then he goes on with the list. Bitterness. Let all bitterness. What a horrible thing bitterness is. We are warned how that bitterness can actually hinder our prayer lives. 
It can take hold in your life and defile you. The Bible tells us to put away all bitterness. There is a classic example in the Old Testament of a man who became bitter and his bitterness led to his ultimate suicide. He was bitter. The man was a Hithophel. And you may recognize that name as a name that's associated with King David. Because Ahithophel was one of David's chief counselors. A close friend and confidant. David, in speaking of the breach that came in their relationship, said, if it were an enemy that were, had reproached me, then I could have borne it. But it was you, my close friend. We went into the house of God together. We enjoyed the companionship, but to have you turn against me. But Ahithophel had become bitter with David. And he left David, left the court of the king, and lived in bitterness until the time that Absalom, the son of David, decided to rebel against his father and by force take the kingdom from his father. And Ahithophel came to Absalom and volunteered his services. Volunteered to help Dave, uh, help Absalom drive David from the kingdom and bring the kingdom into the hands of Absalom. And as Absalom came with the army that had gathered to him to Jerusalem, and David had fled the city. This man Ahithophel, so bitter against David, said, take and put the tent on the roof of the palace and go in publicly in the eyes of all of the people to your father's concubines. Just wanting to totally disgrace David. To show total disdain for this once great king. And then Ahithophel said to, David, said to Absalom, let me take some of the army and let me pursue after your dad and I'll kill him. And the kingdom will be established in your hands. He was wanting himself to kill David. How is it that bitterness can get such a hold on a person? That you turn against one that was once a close friend. One who you used to go into the house of God with. But such was the case with Ahithophel. And this bitterness was eating him up. David had put a spy in the camp of Absalom. He left him, another wise counselor. He was an older man. And he said, David, I'm going with you. David said, oh no, you can do me more good. Just stay back here and, and try to thwart the counsel of Ahithophel. And so he stayed back. And when Ahithophel said, let me take the men, we'll pursue after David, he's tired, and all will catch him, I'll kill him. And the kingdom will be yours. This friend of David said, that is not good counsel. 
You know, when you get a, a bear cornered, I mean, then is when he's really dangerous. And uh, David is cornered and, and his mighty men that are with him. Well, you get those fellows cornered. You, you've got a wild, it's like cornering a wild animal. You've got a dangerous situation. Better to wait and get the whole army so that when you go after David, you'll be ensured of victory. And Absalom listened to the counsel of this other fellow and Ahithophel realized that it was, it was poor counsel and thus he was so angry and so bitter because his counsel was rejected and he realized that this other counsel could be disastrous. He went out, he knew that he had cut the bridges with David and he went out and he killed himself. Bitterness. You say, well, what could make him so bitter? If you'll check the biblical record closely, you'll discover that Bathsheba was his granddaughter. And when David had gone in to his granddaughter and then had his grandson put to death by marriage, he became bitter. And this bitterness was there and festered until it finally destroyed him. You allow bitterness to fester in your heart. Ultimately, it will destroy you. But in the meantime, that bitterness grieves the Holy Spirit. If you have bitterness in your heart today towards someone, you may have every right in the world to be bitter as far as right goes. It could be that they have genuinely, deliberately injured you. And you say, I have a right to be bitter over this. And you can maintain your right to be bitter. But let me tell you something. Your bitterness is hurting you more than it's hurting them. And the bitterness will ultimately destroy you. Because it grieves the Holy Spirit. None of us can afford to hold on to bitterness. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. These things, this is a list of things that grieve the Holy Spirit. Put them away from you. Don't keep company with them. Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God by which you've been sealed unto the day of redemption. But he goes on with the list. On into chapter 5, verse 3, he said, But fornication and uncleanness or covetousness let it not be once named among you as becometh saints. These kind of attitudes, bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, malice, those kind of attitudes grieve the Holy Spirit. But these kind of actions also grieve the Holy Spirit. Fornication, sexual impurity, covetousness. And he goes on, neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor jesting, which are not convenient, that is, are not proper. They are not, there is a undertone of, of suggestion and evil. For this, no. 
that no whoremonger nor unclean person nor covetous man who is an idolater hath any inheritance. Now we talked about the glorious inheritance. God has sealed us to the day of redemption. But you can grieve the Holy Spirit of God. And if you get involved in these things, you grieve the Holy Spirit of God and you become fornicator, whoremonger, covetous, idolater, know that you will have no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Don't let any man, Paul said, deceive you. For because of these things, the wrath of God is going to come on the children of disobedience. Don't let someone deceive you that you can go ahead and do these things and still inherit the kingdom of God. That you can allow these attitudes or you can uh, participate in these kind of activities as a child of God and still maintain a relationship with God. He is a Holy Spirit. He is grieved by these things. And we are exhorted not to grieve the Holy Spirit who has sealed us until the day of redemption. So Paul said, don't be a partaker with them. But then he goes on to show the things that enhance the Holy Spirit's relationship to us and us with Him. He said, be ye kind one to another. Tender-hearted and forgiving one another. Even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. Don't hold on to bitterness. Don't hold on to anger, to malice, to covetousness, but be kind, be tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake has forgiven you. You say, Chuck, that's all well and good. But you don't know the evil that they did to me. How it has scarred me. How it has almost destroyed my life. How that I just am tormented in my mind over those things that were done. And I can't forgive them. And I do understand that there have been things that people do that are so vicious, so vile. That in the natural, you can't forgive. I understand that. But we're not talking about the natural. We're talking about the supernatural. We're talking about what God wants to do in your heart and in your mind if you'll just but let Him. We're talking about the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit indwelling you, sealing you with God's mark of ownership. Until the day that God claims that which is His own, that which He purchased. And as we have been dealing with the subject of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer to give us power to be conformed into the image of Jesus Christ, 
Peter said, Consider him who endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, who when he was reviled, reviled not again. But he prayed for those who were so abusing him. Father, forgive them. And he can give you the capacity. The Holy Spirit can give to you the power to forgive. And you will not start being healed in your own mind until you do forgive. The reason why this thing still troubles you, the reason why you still have so many problems as a result of it is because you haven't forgiven. You're holding on to it. It's festering. That bitterness is just festering. And it destroys. It's really not an option. It's a necessity. It's vitally important. Because bitterness defiles. It's vitally important that you bring this to the Lord and say, Lord, help me. Give to me the power of the Holy Spirit to forgive those wrongs, those evils that were done against me by those evil persons. God, help me to forgive them. That I might be freed. That I might be cleansed from this which will only defile as long as I'm hanging on to it. It's going to keep me defiled and less than what God would have me to be. It will hold back the blessings of God as I hold on to these things. It grieves the Spirit of God. Ask God's help. He'll do it. He can do it. He can wash this out of your mind. He can wash this out of your life. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. The old things are passed away. Let them pass away. Let them go. All things become new. Go on from there. But grieve not the Holy Spirit of God who has sealed you to that day of redemption. Father, we thank you for the wonderful work of the Holy Spirit in sealing us. Thank you, Father, for this gift of the Spirit whereby we know that we are yours. Your mark and stamp of ownership on our lives. The down payment. Thank you, Lord, for the joy, the glory, the blessedness of walking in the Spirit and living in the Spirit and being filled with the Spirit. That overflowing cup, that rich overflowing life. Father, how we thank you for it. Lord, help us that we would not allow any attitude to master our hearts that would grieve the Holy Spirit of God. And may we not get involved in any activity that would grieve the Holy Spirit of God. But may we be holy, for you are holy. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.